are visual patterns and how can they open up new possibilities for building math routines? I'm Steph, and today on the Heinemann Podcast, we're passing things over to Kent Haynes. Kent is a Heinemann Fellow alum and middle school math educator based in Alabama. He's joined by Fawn Wynn. Fawn is a well-known math educator and is currently a teacher on special assignment where she supports K-8 through math teachers and their students. Kent and Fawn discuss the importance of building trust and respect in the classroom and how to incorporate visual patterns into your instruction. As always, to read a transcript of this episode, you can visit blog.heinemann.com. In 2013 and 2014, I had a very challenging school year. Uh, I was in a very difficult school with a brand new administration, and for many reasons, I just felt like I couldn't be the teacher that I wanted to be. And sometimes during my prep period at the end of the day, instead of planning the next day's lesson, I would sit there and imagine what my class could be like when I got a chance to start over again in a new school year. And during those prep periods, I very often read the blog of my guest, Fawn Wen. Fawn was writing about middle school math as well, but her room sounded so vibrant to me, so exciting, so full of interesting math conversations. It sounds funny to say this, but I read Fawn's blog from cover to cover that school year and then went back and reread all of my favorite entries. I set out the next school year to make a class that felt more like hers. And although my classroom still doesn't feel like hers, at least it feels like mine, which I think is the real point. I was not surprised then that Fawn was featured in the book Motivated by Alana Horn, whom I spoke with a couple of months ago. You can find that interview in our archive. Fawn, over the past couple of decades, has created a unique math classroom culture around problem solving and mutual cooperative struggle, and I'm thrilled to get to talk to her about it. We'll also delve into her work with visual patterns, as well as some of the interesting wrinkles that come along with her latest position with the Rio School District in California as a teacher on special assignment, a job's title that sounds extremely cool and fancy. Fawn, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kent, for having me. I can't help but in your introduction, I just heard the word vibrant. And uh, it reminds me of, you know, when people come over and, and, and see the house or the yard, they say, gosh, everything is just so beautiful. You have a green thumb and all this. And I think, well, that's because the dead ones, you know, <laughs> I get rid of those fast. So all the, non, the non-vibrant lessons. I didn't blog about those. <laughs> oh, well, that's, you know, that's that's a good point. But it, it sure it sure looked great from over where I was sitting. Across thank you. The country. Thank you. Yeah. So, so let's just start with a big one. What is most important to you in establishing a classroom culture? You know, just from a 30,000 foot view, what do you see as the most important aspects of of Miss Wynn's math class? I hope that it is one of respect. And I know that can be vague and, and general and um, but in order for us to do anything, I think in any environment that that needs to be established. And so specifically respect in a class means the kids know that I value what they have to say. They value each other's, what each other, their peers have to say. So that gets established and that, you know, it, it's from bell to bell, right? So that whatever we're doing today, it's because I thought a lot about it. I respect their time. They respect my time how we behave, you know, just uh, tuning in, listening, recording, and and acknowledging each other. You know, I can can, um, think of a great lesson, have a great lesson, but if we don't have that already kind of blanket um, respect uh, for what will happen in this room, then very well could just fall flat. And so how do you go about creating that, that sense in your classroom? You know, starting, you know, day one, you know, the beginning of the school year, what are you doing to make that clear that you respect their time and, you know, and, and you have a respect for their input and, and all of these sorts of things? Well, in, in terms of, yeah, specifics, I guess it, it boils down to the, the two rules that I have on day one, I tell the kids, and it's just only two rules. One is um, never tell an answer and never give up. So the never give up is to respect yourself. Right, to give yourself time to work on the problem that I'm giving you time. I want, I wish, you know, that you do the same to yourself, give yourself time to work on it. And then um, never tell an answer, which means more of never blurt out an answer, means to respect others so that others can think, you know, you don't take that away from them. 
And a lot of what you've done seems to be around the idea of problem solving, because of course, if you say never, never give up, um, but then they're just doing a bunch of sort of low level, low engagement problems. Well, they might not even need to have that persistence because, you know, if you're just giving them, here's the radius of a circle, find the area, here's the radius of a circle, find the area, here's the radius of a circle, find the area, they're not going to do that. So can you talk about the sort of activity structures and routines that get the kids to find that perseverance and get them cooperating where they're not just blurting out answers and that sort of thing. Right. So there, there are two parts, or I see as two sides of the problem solving coin. The one is literally I take problems from outside of the curriculum, right? Um, they are non-routine and uh, they're just, um, you know, something that they would never find in a textbook. So it's literally outside of the curriculum. And then the other side is it's a curricular, but I try to make it so it's non-routine. I just stopped telling them what to do, right? Just kind of invert the normal routine of, uh, you know, I teach them, I tell them what to do, and then they later just follow my steps. So, uh, you know, we, we and the three-app task, I think um, that's widely used. It's more common now is that's the idea is we just um, kind of uh, spark their interest with an image or a short video clip. And we start from there. So it's, it's, um, it's you know, starting with a question, I guess, a really good question and um, just see where the kids take it um, and, and how we can, um, how we can scaffold, how we can come in with the right questions at the right time. Because the goal of that, I guess, is if I'm trying to get kids to think, I have to begin with something they care to think about. So it's, it's a lot of behind the scenes, I suppose, lesson planning, that I, I pick the task and then I, I just walk it through in my mind, you know, how, how, which is actually very simply, what do the kids, you know, asking the kids, what do you know already? what comes to mind? What do you notice and wonder, right? Those those good routines that we are resorting to. And um, so I, I go from there. And then, of course, my behind the scene is what if they say this? What if they say that? And then what is my next move? So it's it's the planning of um, a bunch of next moves. And, and how do I add a constraint one at a time to make it so that um, I'm giving them something, but then uh, at the same time in a form of a question to kind of activate more questions, I suppose. I hope that makes sense. You know, with a video clip or an image of any problem I pose, let's exhaust what we can do with this information in front of us. You know, look at it sideways, upside down, talk to your neighbor so that we have exhausted everything we can talk about with this picture, with this video clip. And then we go from there. We can always, we can always add. And so it sounds as though the way that you're focusing your time in the classroom is on fewer, more interesting or deeper problems or tasks rather than getting to many different things in the same, you know, in the same class period. And I imagine there are some teachers listening who might be really interested in trying some of these more non-routine questions, but are, but are concerned about, well, are we still going to be able to get the students comfortable and fluent with like the basic skills of, you know, like I, maybe I want to do this really interesting task about proportional relationships, but I also just want to make sure that they can just, uh, at a very basic level, find the the missing value in a proportional situation. How do you feel about that tension um, that a lot of teachers may feel? Right, because we're always concerned and rightfully so about the amount of time, right? And it goes back to, I'm going to respect your time. I'm not going to waste your time. So all of that thinking, I ho certainly hope it's not a waste of time. You know, teachers, we might be get anxious about our wait time. And it's been documented that, you know, the, with with the task, we, I, I think in Peter Lishaw's book, it's like 4.22 uh, two seconds that we wait. And before we just tell them, you know, this is this is how you do the problem. So the investment, I guess, to look at it, what you're asking, I think the investment initially seems like it takes a long time. But then, well, a long time compared to what? If you compare it to how we traditionally teach things, sure. But the, that initial investment of time pays back dividends. Because when, when stuff comes from the children themselves, right, they've made the connections and you help them make, string those connections along the way, it retains better, right? There's, there's a better understanding. There's deeper dive so that they will pick up all the other steps, right? all the other things more naturally just and, and and apply it more broadly 
So yeah, it's just it's just a matter of you know more bang for your buck at the at the beginning, mm-hmm. and then and you save time overall actually just because otherwise kids would just think all these problems are different and they're discrete. So every time they see something, and they think it's new. I mean, I've heard teachers um, whom I support would say, I just showed it to them. And, you know, we just did this exact problem. Okay, the, you know, a number, one number changed. And they will literally look back at you and say, how do I do this? Or what, see, why is that, where is that coming from? That a teacher, you know, did her, you know, uh, duty by telling the kids what to do step by step. And we think we couldn't be any clearer, right? And a kid will, after all of that, and they would do it along with us. But when they're set to, on their own, they will tell you, I don't get it. Mm-hmm. So where does that come from? Well, that's because we've been making all the connections in our head. And sure, it's, 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 it's clear to us because we gave the problem. We're doing the problem. We're doing all the work, right? All the heavy lifting. And so um, just because we taught it doesn't mean they learned it. Yeah, I, I often think about, like you were saying, the investment in time in a routine is really valuable if you're going to use a routine several times, many times throughout the year. And I, I, I like to think about it like, you know, the first few weeks of the school year, the thing that I am teaching the students is the routine like we do. When I give you a problem, I want you to think about it and write something down silently for two minutes. And then I want you to share with your table for three minutes. And then, you know, we'll come together and here's how we here's how we share a student's thoughts and here's how we respond to a student. And I think about teaching all of those norms as being precise things that I'm also trying to communicate at the beginning of the school year. And so to me, it feels like, okay, that's that's worth it, because if I'm teaching them something they're going to be using all year long then it's going to be worth it because the 20th or 30th time that they get a problem that they don't know how to solve yet, they know, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to try to figure this out for a couple minutes and then I'm going to get a chance to talk to somebody and then maybe somebody from another table will have an idea. And I've sort of built in that time into the beginning of my school year to do that. But something that I think is particularly interesting is what you mentioned, the outside of the curriculum questions ones that aren't necessarily tied to the unit or the topics, the the standards that you're teaching. What do you see as being your primary goal with finding non-routine problems that are just, you might find in a book of mathematical puzzles or or something like that? I think most importantly, it, it hits at the eight math practices so well, or I should say the textbook problems do not allow children to um, master or have those proficiencies of the eight math practices. If we just do exercises, how do you persevere? How do you critique each other's reasoning? So it just lends itself better to allow children to develop those proficiencies with a non-routine task in the structure that is built in that, you know, they will have quiet time, like you mentioned, and then small group and then larger group, and then we all connect so we're having all these opportunities for the kids to build their, their um, problem-solving strategies, right, the toolbox, because of the variety and the different types. Eventually, right, if you do those regularly, that the children will say, oh, I've, I've seen something similar. And so they start applying or they start extending the problem. The eight math practices is the main goal of that. And, and there is just a whole lot of fun. Some, are hist- uh, some have historic actually many have historic uh, backgrounds that that I get a chance, you know, after we debrief and we connect the problems, you know, we can, I can get to say, you know, this problem took hundreds of years for mathematicians to solve. And here we are, we get to (laughs) to work on it. So I want to take sort of maybe a different perspective on problem solving just for this last question and kind of, and push on it, push on it a little bit, because there's an idea that I've heard sort of a, I guess, a challenge to the idea of teaching problem solving. Um, I'll try to summarize the, the idea here, which is when we're trying to teach problem solving as an idea, that is maybe too big and broad of a, of a framework or a way of thinking about it in, in the same way that number sense is something that we as teachers want our students to have. But when you really drill down and think about number sense, what we want is for students to have a specific set of um, tools or heuristics or ways of thinking about numbers. So, you know, one thing that I might want to teach my students is how to quickly and effectively find half of a number. And that's one sort of specific facet of number sense that might be really helpful to them. When we're teaching problem solving, we're actually trying to teach a series of 
techniques or tactics that might help. So for example, to give a, a kind of a classic problem, the, the handshake problem, right? You ask the whole class, hey, if everybody in this room shook hands with each other, how many total handshakes is that? And it's a great question because the students immediately understand what the question is asking, but they don't understand how to find the answer. And so there's going to be a lot of different techniques and students are going to try different things. But one specific technique that students could use could be to solve a simpler version of the same problem. So instead of a class of 25 kids, it's a table of four kids and they all shake hands with each other and see how many handshakes that was. And then they imagine adding one more and seeing how many handshakes and so on and so on. And that's a great example of a particular technique for solving particular types of problems. And so I guess when you're finding these, you know, non-routine problems like, you know, the handshake problem or what have you, do you think about particular techniques of problem solving that you want the students to have exposure to? Do you name them in class? Or is it more like you were saying, the just overall goal of instilling the habits of perseverance, working together, that sort of thing? Oh, absolutely. The habits, but no, also, no, very focused on the strategies because there are efficient strategies and there are non-efficient strategies. The one you, um, you know, do a simpler problem. That is, that's um, it's one of my students and I love it when they go there, right? They, they, they say it out as I'm going to do a simpler problem and I'm going to start with one person. I'm going to start with two people. They will start at zero if they need to, that kind of thing. So it's, yeah, no, absolutely these specific strategies. And we keep a, a, a running record of, on the board. You know, so if this is the first time we do the handshake and first time that we do a simple problem that gets that gets written on the board and it stays there. And the next time we do working backwards is another favorite strategy, mm -hmm. working backwards. Or um, create a table so that we're more systematic just uh, all these different strategies using a spreadsheet in that which is different than just just recording x and y just recording systematically with the spreadsheet i meant with the intention of the the formulas behind it you know all, all those different strategies of um in in terms of problem solving it definitely gets recorded and, and we can refer to it and the kids can say you know have we that's what I meant by have you seen something similar so that we can go back and use that strategy that was um that was fruitful or that was efficient. That's great. And, and the more I think about it, the more interested I am in trying to come up with that master list of all possible problem solving strategies. Of course, there is probably no such thing as a master list, but you know, some of the most uh, common- I have activities. the master list spent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm my, sure you my do. Students, my students have a master list. Yeah, it, 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 was, you know, it was more than 10, I'm sure. And I have a, a slide of it. and. Uh, yeah. That's great. And, and so it's cool, right? Would you actually see it building up on it? And and one of the one of the strategies on it, and I I normally don't see and I actually use it a lot and I, I advise my students to do it, is take a break, right? Walk away. Yeah, because I've solved lots of things um, when I'm like, okay, you know, that sweet, sweet struggle spot has, has come and gone. I, I'm now, I don't want to be frustrated. I think that's really important with students. To, um, and just in life, right? You, you walk away, come back with fresh eyes and, and some sleep <laughs> will serve you well. Yeah, acting it out, by the way, the handshake, when you were talking about the handshaking, another strategy is acting it out. Mm -hmm. One other problem solving structure that I, well, a lot of people have probably seen and may, may have seen on your very fabulous website is something called a visual pattern. Now, this is not a visual medium, so I'm going to do my best to describe this as simply as anybody can imagine it. So what you would see if we were doing a visual pattern problem in my classroom or in your classroom would be three images of, let's say, the first three figures in a pattern. So maybe the first figure is an L shape where you've got three squares stacked on top of each other and then two coming off to the right. It's making an L. And then the next figure in the pattern is still an L shape, but it's bigger. There's four squares stacked on top of each other and three going off to the side. And then the next one, figure three, is even bigger. There's five stacked on top and four going off to the side. And there will be a question that comes from this, I, the sort of most natural question is what comes next, right? What's the next figure in the pattern? But you might ask students, um, how many squares will there be in the 10th figure? How many squares will there be in the 43rd figure? And it's a uh, it's a fabulous structure. I, I use it, um, 
I use it a great deal to teach a lot of different topics in middle school math, although I think it's also really helpful in elementary. It's also helpful in high school, talking about functions and all sorts of things. Um, I'd love to hear how you first came across it and how it became the case that you created this wonderful website, visualpatterns.org, where you can find hundreds of these visual patterns for your classroom. Yeah, visual patterns. I first, um, it was a class during the summer that I took. It was in Portland, Oregon. I just gave birth to my youngest, my daughter. So that was 26 years ago. And so, yeah, just in the class. And I love doing it. That's what we were doing. We were given a visual pattern to extend and, and ultimately to write the equation for it. And yeah, so I just started building, um, just making my own. I had a collection just uh, at back those days, you know, didn't use it's just on paper. I had a journal. I just start building them. And then eventually, when I'm started being online, I guess after my blog, I um, I start looking for resources. I've seen them in books, you know, uh, certain collections of them, but there was not uh, just a you know, bunch of patterns. And so that's how visual patterns started. I, I, you know, when I started the site, I maybe I put in 50 patterns that I've had. And um, yeah, but can you believe there are over 400 patterns now from uh, from teachers and students from um, from across the globe? I want to say so super super cool. It, it it is what it is because of people um, contributing to it. So I am just just very proud and thrilled. Really, it, it is honestly the one routine, a warm up routine where I'm seeing the most growth in, in kids. And with my role as a Tosa. I get to be in the elementary classrooms, and I have done them with first graders, and you know all through the, uh, through the grades. So first graders is so wonderful. It's amazing. It's amazing what you can do. Yeah, the first thing is you know what comes next, but then they I was able to uh, get them to connect um, the general rule. I mean, not so much with the variables in it, but the, they can certainly describe with words. Uh, you know, given any step, right? They can articulate. This is how the pattern will grow. So. Yeah. And and why, you know, I have my own answers to this because I am also a huge uh, practitioner of visual patterns. Um, but why do you think they are such a powerful structure? Why do you think it is that kids can show so much growth in sort of coming back to this same structure of here's three images, what comes next, what comes in the 10th, what comes in the unknown figure, figure N? What, why, why do you think it works so well? Well, I, I hope it's because there are lots of patterns in life, in nature, right? There are lots of patterns in nature, our mind, and then the the kind of the classical, typical definition of mathematics is the study of patterns. And then our mind wants to extend when we start seeing something of you know, progression like that. You know, it just kind of naturally add on to it. And yeah, and um, and it's okay if you make a mistake. Right? I think it's it also feels safe because... And, and that's why I'm, I need to stay true with the visual because teachers, I think, if they've not done visual patterns uh, before, they tend to uh, you know, just count up the objects and set up an XY table right away. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I ask them not to do just because we want to honor the visual. Right? So stay with the visual. And that's why I do all the, the coloring. We, we break up that pattern, um, those steps into parts. Right? Each, you know, what parts do you see? I, I ask two questions. What part is changing? What part stays the same? That's it. Just keep it really simple. And so that track the change. Is the change consistent? Right? We have that language. Is it increasing by a regular number? Is it staying the same? And, you know, just... And so they, they can play around with it and it's okay to be wrong. And it, it's not so uh, numerical, right? You don't have to jump into the numbers right away um, because kids you know, might be have anxious when, when numbers are there already. Here we're just describing and, and it's, it's kind of safe to fall back. Well, I'm giving three patterns to look at and I can test it. And, and they can test each other's patterns and reason. And immediately you can have critiquing. I mean, even with eighth graders, when they draw a different um, step four, I can ask them, look at each other's and have a, a question. Does it matter You know that, that your, your sketches are different? And why does it matter? That's great. I have found, I think the focus on the visual to me is such a powerful part of it in particular. And I, I actually taught uh, for a couple of years at the University of Alabama in Birmingham, a class for elementary education majors. So these were college students who were eventually going to be elementary 
math teachers. I mean, they, they saw themselves as just, oh, I want to be a third grade teacher, but they're all going to be math teachers. And most of them had had pretty negative mathematical experiences themselves, felt very uncertain about math. And so the, the goal of the class was to get them to see a different, a different way that math could be taught that might have worked better for them and, and to engage with some material that maybe they were uncomfortable with. And so, you know, we, we would progress it from draw the next figure in the pattern all the way up through finding the simplified formula for a quadratic visual pattern or, or what have you and doing all those sorts of things. But from the start of it, the thing that I think really connected with the with my students who were going to be teachers themselves was I did not see it that way at all the way you're telling me, but we still get the same answer. And that idea of visual equivalence between two different ways of seeing the pattern that then was reflected in numerical equivalence as they started writing variable expressions for the problem, they could get equivalent expressions, but it all came down to that idea of there's more than one correct way. There, it's not, there are many correct ways to see this pattern. Right. As long as exactly. you see it accurately, you're doing the problem right. And I just thought, I, I think that's really giving them permission to have a different answer that's still the same in some way is a big thing. Right. And I, yeah, right. And I still, you know, it doesn't get old when people say, oh my gosh, I've never, I never saw it that way. And so my kids, you know, over the years, by the time they're eighth grade, um, it's hard to find a, a, a visual pattern to challenge them. So their own challenge is to find, you know, another way to see it. So on their paper, you just see, you know, they're going at it just, uh, oh, my gosh, I, I want to find another way because so that they can share with the class. Yeah. And, and particularly right with those upper middle school students um, going to figure N and getting the expression for figure N. And for example, because it's visual, n and n squared are such very obviously different objects on a visual medium because n squared is literally a square. It's like, you know, for figure 10, it would be a 10 by 10 square. It's way bigger than 10. Um, and so, you know, my students, I think, have had so much less trouble combining like terms because they don't have an impulse to combine n with n squared because they've they see n squared as a square and they see n exactly. as a bar. Of something. Right. When we ask these expressions to match the visual that they see, they really respect the parentheses, right? Because later on with my sixth graders, they are, they are careful with it. They understand. And then order of operations becomes key. They understand why they would want to add these two first before, you know, operate what's inside the parentheses first. All of that comes into play when they get to eighth grade and need to simplify the equations combined like terms, it all makes sense now. Oh, yeah. And, and uh, just, you know, distributing, would you, they're just being careful of the groupings. So moving into your latest position, you are now a teacher on special assignment. Um, so you are, you no longer have your own just particular classroom, although you're still in lots of classrooms throughout your district. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the work that you're doing as a teacher on special assignment? So my role is to support teachers uh, and their students. And uh, my favorite um, is still uh, you know, getting to do a model lesson, coming in and, and, and do a lesson, and then debriefing with the teachers. And hopefully, you know, uh, whether it's a number talk or a visual pattern or a three act task, this is something that is they normally right, don't see in the curriculum. So, but at the same time, I have to be honest, um, I started this job three years ago. That's when in March, when COVID hit and um, teachers are my heroes prior to COVID and even so much more uh, during this difficult time. So every time, some, you know, people ask me, how's the job going? Well, it's, it's not nearly as hard as how teachers have it in the classroom for sure. And, um, you know, I, after an hour, I get to leave. <laughs> <laughs> so... It just it really depends uh, still on the on the classroom, the norms in the classroom. I see that uh, and I can tell if the kids have, um, you know, have worked in groups before or not, or if that's a regular thing. I tend because I almost always have kids work in groups when I come in, you know, some groups are readily and that just shows that they've done this before. You know, the teachers say some key words and, and they know what to do. And whereas, you know, uh, classrooms where they've not done that and it's just, it's, it's just more obvious or kids getting kids to talk. So I'm hoping uh, that some of the stuff I can bring in because I, I truly don't believe um, we learn if we don't talk, but it has to be safe. So we're back to that respect thing, right? Back to the respect, feeling safe and respected in order for us to share. 
it, this job sounds, uh, it reminds me a lot of what I hear from teachers in my district, like the el- elementary math coaches um, who, who work with elementary teachers and that sort of thing. And I think it's such an interesting job because you're not anybody's uh, direct superior. You're not giving them their marching orders, you know, and and they probably wouldn't listen to you anyway if you did, because um, as much as we want, uh, we want teachers to be creating these classrooms with rich conversation, that sort of thing. We also know that uh, that's something that cannot be imposed from above and that teachers value autonomy a great deal. I value autonomy a great deal as a teacher. I want to be able to have the discretion to make a decision that, oh, no, this task will be a better way of my students understanding this standard and that my fundamental goal is to get my kids to understand the standards. So how do you feel, how do you balance that, the the desire to want to share these ideas with teachers who might not have seen them, um, while at the same time not wanting to seem as though you're, you know, imposing any sort of specific structure, you know? Back to the uh, respect, right? I um, The teacher knows their children best, and they are doing the best that they they, they can. And and the fact that they asked me to bring me in, to invite me in, is, is huge. I mean, that's, I guess the word is being vulnerable, right? Um, to invite somebody in and, and to do a lesson or just ask for me to co-plan. So immediately, it's like a huge thank you uh, to to allow me to give me permission to share. And uh, hopefully, when they ask me to model a lesson, that they see their children talk. It's, yeah, I have had teachers say, "Oh my gosh, I didn't know so and so, you know, had those ideas," or "I've never heard that student talk. They're very, very quiet." Just you know, structures to invite children to talk. Yeah, when I mean, I was not a talker when I was in school. But if you build these structures in of the quiet think time, and then you just partner up with one other person, and you have um, you say things like you know nobody, and in small groups you say things like nobody talks twice until everybody talks once, and then you also have allow a chance to pass. So all those built in, those are actually routines so that make it more conducive. For children to speak, especially we have English learners, and I'm, you know, I feel like I'm still an, an English learner. Be respectful of that. But yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that whatever they see, it, it's not so much me, but their children. How I, how I can bring their children to talk and those ideas, because yeah, my work was behind the scenes, so that when I come in, I just need to say some key things with the problem, with the questions that I pose for their kids to explore. And um, I've read somewhere that the difference between a master teacher and a beginning teacher is furthering the conversation, right? Asking questions so that the discussion can, 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 can elicit more questions, that kind of thing, because um, the newer teachers will, 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 will have this lesson and it's wrapped up. It's really packaged and, and it's done, it's over with. So it's, it's, it's tougher or it's more challenging. We have to think about how do we get kids to further this conversation so that it continues because, right, mathematically, really nothing really ends. <laughs> Everything connects. I thought I would conclude by asking about this. And this is maybe just another chance for me to brag about your blog, which I have to say, the, the writing that you've done in the past, uh, sometimes about topics that are maybe obliquely mathematical, sometimes not at all, just about your life or people whose stories you're sharing. It's some of the most beautiful writing that I've that I've read and funny writing that I've read in the teaching sphere. But I've noticed about your writing online is that you're you're so willing to share so much about yourself as a teacher, as a parent, um, you know, your personal background. And I'm wondering, is that is that also a part of your classroom culture? Um, is, is that openness something that translates into your role as a teacher? Well, first of all, that, that's just super, super kind, Kent. I really appreciate it because sometimes I, I write and I'm thinking, oh my God, maybe I should delete this. So I, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, that means a lot to me. Um, I, I think, yeah, uh, um, in general, I, it's, it's about relationships, right? Especially, um, with, with younger people that you develop a rapport, that you have that relationship because kids will work harder uh, for you when, when they like you. And, um, you know, I, I end every class with saying I love you. And I think I do that at every, you know, speaking engagement I do because I genuinely 
love and appreciate um, everyone because I'm, I'm able to learn from them. The fact that somebody invites me in or, you know, or that I'm here in front of these children to, you know, these parents trusted me, right, for, for an hour a day with their children. And so that, that's a lot of just being grateful. And I'm grateful for a lot of things. And, um, and so, and I think that's being an immigrant. I know that's being an immigrant has done that for me or, or has taught me that, that, you know, I, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for lots of things. Uh, my life, if I stay back in Vietnam, wouldn't look anything like what it is. And um, my respect for the kids, my respect and love for the kids. And um, I can't expect them to to share and be open and feel safe if we didn't know each other, right? How do we know each other? Well, each one of us uh, have a story to tell, right? So um, have a story to tell and it, it's worthy of, um, of, of finding out and then learning a little bit about each other helps so we can connect. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for getting us, giving us an opportunity to learn a little bit about yourself uh, as a teacher and as a person. Uh, Fawn is a teacher on special assignment at the Rio School District in California, and you can find and must find her blog at her personal website, fawnwin.com. Uh, thank you so much, Fawn. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'm honored. Our thanks to Kent and Fawn for their time today. You can learn more about Kent and his work by following him on Twitter at Kent Haynes or visiting his website, gamesforyoungminds.com. Fawn's work can be found on Twitter at Fawn P. Wynn and at fawnwin.com. The Heinemann Podcast is a production of Heinemann Publishing. It is produced and edited by Steph George. Sound mixing by Steph George. Our creative producer is Lauren Audette. And our executive producer is me, Brett Whitmarsh. To learn more about the Heinemann Podcast, visit blog.heinemann.com. Thanks for listening. Copyright Heinemann Publishing.